Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mercatus Center. My name is Kathleen O'Hearn, and I work on state issues here at the Mercatus Center. And on behalf of everybody here, um, thank you so much for joining us today um, to talk about this important issue and discussing tax and expenditure limitations. Um, the Mercatus Center has been working diligently the past few years on pragmatic solutions for state spending and state budgets. And so we're going to hear about one of those issues today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for today, Jim Musser. Um, Jim is the Director of Economic Education here at the Mercatus Center, where he is responsible for leading the federal and state outreach teams. Prior to joining Mercatus, Jim served as a senior staff counsel to the Honorable Jim Bunning, where he worked on tax, budget, and legal issues. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Thank you very much, Kathleen. It is my pleasure to introduce your panel today. Uh, we're going to just start and go down, go down the roll, and then they'll be making their presentations to you individually. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Matt Mitchell, a research fellow with the State and Local Policy Project here at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dr. Mitchell's research focuses on spending and budget issues, particularly the ways in which government policy is developed and how it impacts various measures of well-being. Dr. Mitchell received his PhD in economics from George Mason University and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Arizona State University. Dr. Mitchell has recently published a study entitled Tell It Like It Is, Do State Tax and Expenditure Limitations Actually Limit Spending? which discusses the issue in some detail. His work has been featured in numerous national media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, National Public Radio. He has appeared on C-SPAN. And Dr. Mitchell blogs about economics and economic policy at neighborhoodeffects.org. We are exceptionally pleased today to have with us Micah Z. Kellner. He is an assemblyman from the state of New York, representing the people of New York's 65th district. He was first elected in June, 19, uh, June 2007. Prior to that, he was a grassroots community activist with an accomplished record in public service, and he won nearly 65% of the vote in a special election to replace former assemblyman Pete Granis. Prior to his election to the assembly, Micah served as an aide to several leading elected officials, including United States Senator Chuck Schumer and Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney from New York City and New York City Com Comptroller William C. Thompson. On the staff of Representative Maloney, he worked on issues involving affordable housing and tenants' rights. And Assemblyman Kellner has also served both Maloney and Thompson as a community liaison to Manhattan's East Side and Roosevelt Island and he became a dedicated activist on issues affecting the community and, in fact, all New Yorkers. He works side by side with leaders and members of neighborhood and citywide civic associations such as the East 79th Street Neighborhood Association, the East 86th Street Merchants and Residents Association, and the Carl Schultz Park Association. Thank you for being with us, Assemblyman. And finally on our list, we have a good friend from the Tax Foundation, Nick Kasprak. He is a programmer and analyst with the Tax Foundation. Nick focuses on building interactive web-based tools to educate taxpayers. And before joining the Tax Foundation, he worked as a math teacher at Loomis Chafee School in Windsor, Connecticut, and coached its debate team. Nick is a graduate of Bowdoin College and holds a BA in Physics and Astronomy. He's the primary programmer for interactive state spending limits calculator that we're going to be seeing today and it will allow you to get online and take a look at what spending would look like in your state if you're imposing certain caps that the Tax Foundation has developed. So thank you, Nick. We're glad to have you with us as well. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Matt Mitchell. Thanks, Jim, and thanks to the other panelists for uh, joining us. I think this should be a, a fun and lively discussion. Um, what I want to do is start by talking a little bit about what exactly tax and expenditure limits are and uh, what aspects of them um, make them work better or make them work less well. So first though, I want to give a little bit of background on why we would even be having this conversation or why we should be talking about tax and expenditure limits. And for that, we need to have a little bit of a perspective on what's been happening with state and local spending over the, over the last several decades. So one way to look at this is to look at the way 
state spending has evolved uh, relative to the private sector. And to try to get an apples, uh, you know, a fair, fair comparison, um, we control both for inflation and then to get an apples to apples comparison, one way to do it is to look at uh, the real level of state and local spending as a multiple of what it was in 1950 alongside the private economy as a multiple of what it was in 1950. So what you can see here is both of these values take one back in 1950, obviously. But on the far right hand side, you see that the real private GDP is about five times what it was in 1950. Um, so this is good. This means that the economy is growing and this is progress. Um, but at the same time, real state and local spending has, is about 10 times its 1950 value. So another way to think about this is that, of course, the private sector is the only uh, real resource that state and local uh, governments have. It is from the private sector that all their resources come. Either they're taxed or they're borrowed from the private sector. Sometimes they're, trans they're, they're taxed or borrowed at the federal level and they're transferred to the states. Sometimes the states do it just, just on their own. But in any case, this is their real asset. This is their source of income. And so what this is, is this is like looking at a family whose income is about five times what it was a few years, years ago, but its expenditures are 10 times what it was a few years ago. So in a word, this is unsustainable. And one of the things I like to emphasize is that this really isn't a right or a left problem. This is just a mathematical problem. And one of the things I, I try to talk to some of my, my friends, uh, more progressive friends, and say this is not something that you should just be irritated or worried about if you're a right-wing conservative. Um, if you are interested in what states do and you think that there is a valuable role for state government, um, this should alarm you. Because the data show that when states do get into crunches, by and large, they usually deal with budget pro uh, problems by cutting spending and doing so precipitously. They don't usually balance their budgets by raising taxes. So if you are year in, year out, unsustainable spending growth, what you're going to find is that you're in a situation where you're going to have to make some precipitous and pretty pretty drastic cuts in spending that are going to be much more painful to endure than if you had left, kept yourself on a steady spending path all along. So how has this changed over time? One way to look at this is, is to look at the ratios. For every dollar that the private sector adds, how much do state and local governments spend? Add. So oh, averaged over the, over the period 1980 to 2009, for the last 30 years, every dollar that the private sector has added, um, the state and local governments have added $1.20. What about a more recent time period from 1995 to 2009? Well, there the ratio grows. For every dollar the private sector added, state and local governments added a buck 40 to their, to their budgets. And then finally, over the most recent time period, just in the last 10 years, for every dollar the private sector added, state and local governments were growing at an average annual basis at nearly twice the rate. So not only is it unsustainable, but it's growing uh, more so over time. Another way to look at this is what is happening in the future? Well, fortunately here we have um, the federal government's Government Accountability Office uh, has analyzed this and they've looked at what is the long-term budget projection for states. And what they say is that states face uh, over the next 50 years about a $9.9 .9 trillion gap. So their, fund, their projected funding increases are simply um, far out, out see, exceeding their projected revenue um, increases. And they exceed it by, by the, to the tune of $9.9 .9 trillion. And so what they calculate is that what's needed in order to bring this long-term fiscal problem in, in uh, line is an immediate 12.3% reduction in state spending or a 12.3% increase in revenue starting immediately and maintained for each and every year for the next 50 years. So that's the bar on the right. That's what's, that's what's necessary to uh, take care of the, the state fiscal problem. To put that in perspective, the bar on the left shows that what states have done in the last, um, in the last year with their general funds. Uh, the last year, they've, they've reduced their general funds by a little over 6%, or a little over 7%, I should say. So they're, not, they're barely doing half of what they need to do in order to bring their budgets in line. Now, a caveat on this, uh, state general funds, many of you may know, are actually less than half of what the typical state spends. They're about 45% nationwide. States have other revenues. They have other funds on which they draw. Um, mainly, it, it, the biggest category there are federal funds, but there are other state funds that are dedicated to cert, certain sources, and there's also bond um, borrowing funds. When you actually lump all that together and you look at all of the resources that state governments have, they've actually increased spending a little bit over the last recession. So you've seen a lot of newspaper reports about the, the cutting to the bone budgets that, that states are doing. Well, all of that, is, all that action is going on in their general funds. 
Now this year is going to be different because this year the state, uh, or the, the federal stimulus uh, bump runs out and the, and the FMAP, the, the increased uh, matching formulas for Medicaid, um, are going to go back down to normal. And so it, this year actually states are, are, for the first time in the recession, um, I think looking at a, at a possibility that overall state spending may, may have to decline. In any case, we're nowhere near grappling with what's, what the long-term problem is. Uh, as the gov Federal Government Accountability Office suggests, they need to cut by about 12.3% and sustain those for the next 50 years. Okay, so with all that as a background, what can we do to try to bring states um, in line? Well, we're at George Mason, where uh, James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in, 19, in economics in 1986. Um, and he did it in large part by pioneering a field of economics known as constitutional political economy. And one of the things that Buchanan drew attention to was the idea that politics takes place sort of on two planes. There is what he called the in-period politics. And this is the day-to-day -day politics where politicians and, and voters and bureaucrats decide what's going to be in the budget. Do we raise taxes? Do we lower taxes? Do we add a, add a program? Do we delete a program? Um, this is sort of the way the game plays out. But then there's another level of politics that he talked about, which is, uh, he, he used the word constitutional, but these are institutional politics and institutional changes where you set the rules of the game. So it's at this level where you decide what, how, what are the rules where the, where the everyday politics take, takes place, what are the rules of those, those games? So can governors, um, do they have a veto power? If they have a veto power, what kind of a veto power is it? Can legislatures run, um, roll over a deficit from one year to the next? Are there term limits? Is it a biannual budget or, or a uh, one-year budget? And are there, are there institutions that restrain the growth, the, the uh, incentives and, and re restrain the behavior of the politicians like tax and expenditure limits? So the important distinction here, and a lot of studies, studies have corroborated this, is that the in-period politics, it's important. That kind of stuff changes your life. Do you, do you pay more taxes? Do you, do you pay less? Do you have uh, a, a program or do you not? But those changes can, can reverse themselves next year. If you get rid of a program, it can come back in the next Congress or the next legislature. The institutional changes have much, much more um, staying power. So if you change uh, the governor's veto power, you, what you'll find is his behavior, his or her behavior, will be affected for decades to come. So I want to focus a little bit on institutional changes. And what these are, are these are things, changes that alter the incentives of the politicians, bureaucrats, and voters. They behave differently in the place of some institutions uh, than in others. So one institution that people have talked about is called a tax and expenditure limit. And this is how it should work uh, in theory is this is a particular kind of tax and expenditure limit. What these are are these are rules, formal rules built into either statutes or constitutions that, s that govern how much the legislature can spend or how much the legislature has in revenue. And they fix it based on a formula. So this example is a formula that's inflation plus population. Um, and what it says is that what would have happened if Arizona had, a, had an inflation plus population limit? And it said that each year, starting in 1995, its budget could only grow at, at the sum of those two figures. Well, this bottom line is what their budget would have been. This red line is what their actual budget has been over that period. Uh, after adjusting for inflation, all this is $2,008. So as you can see, a tax and expenditure limit is, is extremely um, appealing, particularly in theory because it looks like it has the ability to limit spending. Now I picked uh, a, a particularly um, restrictive kind of tax and expenditure limit, inflation plus population limit. We'll get into that. What are the other features of that kind? So this is what, what um, about over, over half of the states have tax and expenditure limits. I think it's 27 at this point. Um, they, were, they started in 1976 with New Jersey. Um, and they've really proliferated over the next several decades. Um, but once you dig into the data, well, you, you don't actually see a picture like this. Instead, you see something like this. So this is the impact of af after you run a, run a regression that controls for all sorts of other factors that might influence state spending, what you find is that tax and expenditure limits in low-income states are associated with less spending. But tax and expenditure limits in high-income states are actually associated with greater spending. So that bears emphasis. It's not that they don't work in high income states. It's not like they have no impact. They actually seem to make the states spend more than they would if they didn't have a tax and expenditure limit at all. So what's going on here? This seems like a, an, a, a pretty odd paradox. 
But to uncover this, you know, sort of break open this onion a little bit, it, it first bears mentioning the tax and expenditure limits have a lot of, there's a wide variety of these things. So I mentioned the formula. Well, the formula matters. You could have it uh, based on, on inflation plus population, which would say the budget or the revenue can only grow at the rate of at the sum of those two figures. Or you could have it uh, say that the budget can't grow faster than income growth, where it says if the, if the residents of the state, uh, if their incomes grow 3%, then the budget can grow 3%. If they grow 4%, the budget can grow 4%, but no, no faster. Another variety is income share, which says if the state spends 10% of all their residents' income, it can't spend any more than that. So it's, it's, it's kind of similar to the income growth, but it works a little bit differently by picking out a share rather than a growth rate. And then finally, there's other varieties, which are um, frankly a little random sometimes. They'll just say the budget can grow no faster than 5.2%. And uh, they just pick a number out. Then there's all sorts of other characteristics, whether they're adopted by the legislature, whether they're adopted by initiative, whether they're constitutional or statutory, um, whether they target spending or revenue. Uh, all tax and expenditure limits can be overridden, but some require a supermajority requirement to be overridden. Um, do they e immediately refund surpluses? Things like that. Well, it turns out when you look a little bit closer, you find that those kinds of factors that uh, change the stringency of a tax and expenditure limit do make a difference. And here again, I've still uh, divided up into low and high income, and you still have this bifurcated effect where in low income states, tax and expenditure limits seem to limit spending, whereas in high income states, they lead to a little bit more. But the other thing to notice is that the more stringent tells, these are tells that are codified in constitutions, um, that, uh, that limit spending rather than revenue, that, that prohibit unfunded liabilities down to the state levels, that automatically um, refund surpluses. Basically, I built an index that measures how strict it would be. So you, you, you would imagine the more of these types of characteristics it would have, the more stringent it would be. And, it, and, and what I found was that um, states that have these more stringent tells do seem, seem to have more of an impact, but you still have this bifurcated effect. So what's going on with the bifurc bifurcated effect? Well, it turns out that the most popular variety of tell is a kind of tell that's based on income growth. So like I said, it, it'll say if the income of the residents grows at 4%, that's how much the, the budget of the state can grow. Well, if it's based on income growth, that appears to be what's driving this overall factor when you look at the difference in, in the way tells operate in different states. Because what seems to be happening is in a high income state, the tell is acting as an excuse for the legislature to spend up to the limit. So it's not limiting. And it's not like they're avoiding it or getting around it some other way. It's actually, they, without the tell, they probably would not spend as much. Um, we can get into some of the, uh, maybe in the question and answer, if anybody is um, interested, we can get into some of the ways we try to measure, measure this. But um, the other thing to point out is that that inflation plus population basis tell, which is the kind that I, sh that I showed with Arizona, it doesn't have this characteristic. Um, a lot of fiscal conservatives like this type of tax and expenditure limit because uh, typically, inflation plus population is less than income growth, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a strict limit. But the other thing that makes it a nice characteristic is it doesn't have this weird effect where in high income states it perversely encourages them to spend more. So the formulas matter. The interesting thing, by the way, is that some of those other formulas don't matter at all, don't seem to impact at all. So if it's based on income share, which a lot of tax and expenditure limits are, it doesn't seem to affect spending one, one, one bit. Um, so what, just to kind of summarize, what makes for a good tell? Well, it, it turns out, like I said, inflation plus population basis is, is a nice characteristic. Um, I also found that if it were constitutional rather than statutory, that seems to make it a much more effective tax and expenditure limit. If, it, if its target is spending rather than revenue, that seems to make it more impactful. Um, this means that the legislature can't spend it anyway, and it, um, it, there's no way to get around it through, uh, through borrowing or something like that. And then finally, um, if it automatically and immediately refunds surpluses. This has a nice characteristic because it doesn't give the legislature any chance to spend it. And two, it gives the taxpayers a, something that they, that they value in the tax and expenditure limit. So it makes sure that they, have an, they see that the checks come in every so often when the, when the government uh, collects more than it should under the tax and expenditure limit. And so then they choose to um, make sure that it stays on the books. Oh, I, there's one more. Um, if it requires a supermajority vote to be overridden, that's, that's uh, incredibly important. Um, some tax and expenditure limits, like I said, they, they can all be overridden, but some require a supermajority requirement. If it doesn't require a supermajority requirement, it's basically not a limit. It's just a recommendation. 
Um, so the final thing I want to end with, though, is to point out the tax and expenditure limits are not the only tool in the toolkit of legislators or policymakers who are trying to figure out how to limit state spending. Um, there are other factors that studies have shown seem to impact state spending. Supermajority requirements for tax increases, strict rather than weak balanced budget requirements, item reduction vetoes, um, and uh, of course collective bargaining reform may be part of the process too. Of course, it's a hot topic right now. Um, so to give you a sense of what, what some of these can do, um, this is a study by Mark Crane. Um, he noted that the, this item reduction veto has this huge power. An item reduction veto is a special kind of veto power, which gives the governor an opportunity to write in a lower amount. He doesn't just have to zero out the item. He can write in the lower amount. Well, this changes the negotiating power between the legislature and the executive. It makes sure that the legislature can't offer the, the executive a take it or leave it offer. Um, so if it, it turns out the states that have an item reduction veto seem to spend about 14% less per capita than other states. Um, like I said, supermajority requirements and strict balanced budget requirements have an impact. Um, those are about comparable to tax and expenditure limits under the best of circumstances. I also put um, biannual budget up, up there just because I think it's interesting. Um, people often talk about this as a potential institutional change. It turns out that states with biannual budgets, two-year budgets, actually spend more than other states. So it might not be a good, a good opportunity. So with that, I will turn it over to the assemblyman. Thank you. Thank and you, I can, I can uh, Ask, answer any questions if, when we're done too. Thank you, Matt. We will now turn to uh, Assemblyman Kellner. Mercatus has a symbol on our logo of a bridge, and it's because we very much work to make sure that we speak not just to the academy, but also to the policy world, and we're constantly looking for ways to translate university-based ideas like those that Mercatus produces so that they can be put into practice by those in the policy world like the assemblyman. And we are very fortunate that he was looking at what we're doing and has agreed to join us today. Well, thank you, Jim. And I really appreciate being here. What, what Jim failed to mention before is I'm not just an assembly member, I'm a democratic assembly member. And I'm, I'm pretty much a dyed in the wool liberal. Is, is this too high? Is this up too high? Is that better? Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the thing he must have used in old bio, because my bio now refers to me as a, a pragmatic progressive, but it uh, doesn't matter how liberal you are or progressive you are, uh, particularly from the state of New York, uh, we have to come to recognize uh, that our, our budget in New York uh, is broken. Um, and when I read uh, Matthew's article in the Wall Street Journal, I immediately uh, tore it out of my fiance's Wall Street Journal. She immediately got mad at me for uh, tearing up the paper before she had gotten it written. I said, oh, it's too late. I've taken it. I got Matt on the phone and read the Mercatus report. Uh, you know, the problem we have in New York, as Matt talked about, is institutional. So if you give me a few moments, I'd just like to talk about sort of the history uh, of New York State. Uh, in 1975, the city of New York had a fiscal crisis. Uh, and the state came to its rescue, but it imposed certain things upon the city. It said, from now on, you have to have an independent budget office. Uh, from now on, you have to have generally accepted accounting principles when using to develop your budget, and you had to st stick to them strenuously. Um, and this helped get New York City out of its fiscal crisis and on, on better sound uh, fiscal footing over the next 40 years. Well, fast forward 40 years later, what does New York State still not have? We still don't go by gap principles. We do not have an independent budget office, and what it allows is for tons and tons of fiscal gimmicks and for an explosion um, in state spending. And, and, and no one can deny this. Uh, we do all sorts of things. We, we say, oh, you know what, we're going to have a deficit. We'll just roll this year's spending. We'll delay the payment, and we'll roll it over into the next budget year. So next year, we'll have a deficit. You know, we will uh, use cash budgeting. You know what, we'll borrow from the pension system. You know what, we'll not just borrow from the pension system, we will delay payments to the pension system costing the taxpayers longer over the course of a period of time. Um, and it's uh, just ridiculous. And you know, the problem that we have is we have an April 1st uh, budget deadline. And this goes back to the time when uh, the 17 and 1800s when many of the legislators were farmers and they had to get back to the planting season. But you know, if we delayed it a month, we'd actually have a better sense of what revenue was. Uh, if we had an independent budget office, uh, we would have real numbers. Instead, what we have in terms of revenue is a political negotiation. Uh, here is one instance where Democrats actually do a decent job. We uh, 
we control the assembly and we actually play by the books. The, the Democrats in the assembly, when we come in with our revenue numbers, we try not to play politics. We usually come in with the lowest number. Uh, the Senate, uh, for the last 40 years, save two, has been controlled by Republicans. They just tend to make their numbers up. They always end up coming up with the highest number. The governor comes up with something in between, and, and we negotiate it out. And you know, for a good portion of that time, especially over the last couple of years during this fiscal crisis, we knew the number that we negotiated at, what the revenue was going to be, was just dead wrong. We knew we were writing rubber checks. We knew we were going to have to come back in the middle of a fiscal year and make cuts. And I always think, whenever I meet with a group who says, Assemblyman, you have to restore this program. This is the greatest program in the world. And that's what I do most days up in Albany. It's just one meeting after another. This, this group telling me why their, their organization is the best and their program is the best and we have to restore that money. And I say to them, wouldn't you prefer to know that I'm going to give you less up front, but if there's more later on, we could possibly give you more, as opposed to saying, oh, I'll give you everything you want up front. And then in the middle of the year, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to take 10% away from you. And your entire budget for that year is, totally, is going to be totally fakakta. It's going to be totally dumb. Um, and you know, wouldn't you prefer that? Uh, I don't want to have to lie to people when it comes to our budget process. And as I said before, we, we have an interesting dynamic in New York State in that um, it's really almost one party rule. From 1968 up until 2009, the Republicans have controlled the assembly. For a two year period, they lost control. They've just regained it back. And from 1975 to the present, the Democrats have controlled the assembly. I'm sorry, the, the Republicans controlled the Senate. And what you have seen time and time again is the Democrats and the Republicans uh, only worried uh, about re-election. Um, and part of this is the gerrymandering of districts, uh, the influence of special interests, um, and the fact that many of my colleagues, not only won't they face a general election, they won't even face a primary most of the time if they make bad decisions that the public doesn't like. Um, and so you have sort of an institutional thing going on wherein you know, they will get together and they will override the governor's veto, and they did this in the Pataki era in the late 2000s, 103 times to restore spending. He went through with a line item veto and he restored spending. Um, he, uh, he vetoed items and they restored all of it. Um, and this is just unsustainable for our state. Um, you know, when we had the fiscal crisis uh, back in 2008, 2009, you know, Matt talked about how states don't normally raise taxes. Well, that's exactly what New York did. We decided we were going to put in a millionaire's tax. Our, our tax rate right now was 6.85%, and we were going to raise that uh, to 8.97% for millionaires. But as the debate went on, it became incredibly clear that that alone on millionaires wasn't going to do enough to uh, raise enough revenue to actually make the restorations people wanted. So suddenly, the millionaire's tax was a half millionaire's tax. But we came to recognize that didn't raise enough money. And then it became, OK, how about families earning $300,000? OK, we'll put it there. Oh, that doesn't raise enough tax revenue. So we'll start it at individuals raising $200,000 and we'll put, we'll put them at an extra point at 7.85%, and we'll put uh, million, uh, people making over $500,000 at 8.97%. Well, for me, I happen to represent the third richest district in the state. Depending on who you ask, I have either the, the most millionaires or the second most millionaires. The, the average income in my district is about $182,000. So for me, this is hitting middle class families. And to sort of explain to you uh, how you, you laugh when, when I say middle class families, but we have actually rent regulations in our state. We have rent caps on certain types of housing, particularly in the city. Um, and for a long time, and still does, the law said if you make $175,000 and your rent hits $2,000 a year, the landlord can take the rent cap off and he can charge you whatever he wants. And people fought against this. It's been the same. It's been the same income level since 1993. We have to raise the income level. We have to raise the income level. So we in the assembly every year pass a bill that says we want to keep middle class affordable housing. So we'll raise that income level to $250,000. Well, now isn't that a contradiction? 
On one hand, we're saying at $250,000, you're a millionaire. But on the other hand, we're saying at $250,000, you're a middle class individual who needs affordable housing. Which is it? Um, so lo and behold, uh, our new governor, Governor Cuomo, came along. And he basically said, you know, I'm going to attempt to put a stop to this. I am going to put out a budget that has real cuts. Not just cuts into potential growth, but actual cuts from year to year. Um, and this has driven people up a wall. Um, they have gone completely insane over this. Uh, the governor pointed out that our education budget and our Medicaid budget, we spend in New York State more per capita on Medicaid than any other state uh, in the nation. Um, we spend more than California, uh, which I find amazing. We, we have the, the gold-plated uh, Medicaid in our state. We have every one of the 30 plus uh, federal options we offer it here in New York State. And, and Medicaid is a good thing, but, but it is just getting out of control. Um, you know, we, have, we had a $136 billion budget last year. Of that, $60 billion was Medicaid. Uh, the, our other big spending is on education. New York spends a tremendous amount of money on education. Last year, it was over $22 billion on education. And that doesn't include the local property taxes that localities spent. So we, we have these two huge things. And when, when you know, the special interests come up and they decry the cuts, they decry the cuts. But what they're really decrying is uh, the cuts in growth that they expected from one budget year to the next. And if we were to take what we expected this budget year to grow from last budget year, you're talking about a 13.4% increase in Medicaid spending and a 13% increase in education spending. Okay, so we were going to go from $136 billion to $143 billion. And what the governor came in and said is, you know, these formulas, they just don't work. They're out of control. We need to come up with formulas that do work. So he said, I'm going to limit Medicaid's uh, growth to 4%. We're going to use the, uh, what was it, the Consumer Price Index, I believe he said he was going to use. Hold on. Let me find it. He said he was going to use the 10-year rolling average of the medical care component of the Consumer Price Index. And he said, we're actually going to lower Medicaid spending by a billion dollars from this year to last year. On education, he said, you know, we're going we're to cut education as well. We're going to do a 2% cut to education. We're actually going to lower education spending from year to year. And, um, you know, people went nuts. But at the same time, you have school districts out there in New York State that are paying their superintendents $600,000 a year. Um, the, average, the average for a superintendent in New York State is $175,000 a year. But you have some superintendents making upwards of $600,000 a year. And you also have schools with multi-million dollar budget reserves. So if they were going to lose a piece of their, um, of their state share of this funding, they, they could make it up from these rainy day funds. You know, the joke is, well, we're saving that for a rainy day. Well, look outside. It's pouring. Um, and so the governor has you know, said, we're going to redesign how we do these things. And he's done a great job in that he's brought everyone to the table. He's, he's given everyone a choice. He says, we all can sit around the table and work to decide how we're going to make this billion dollars in Medicaid cuts. Um, and we're going to give every stakeholder a chance to make their comments. Or you leave it up to me and the Department of Health Commissioner. Well, let me tell you, every stakeholder leapt to sit around that table. And now groups that at first said, well, we could never sustain the hospitals, um, the, the health care union, 1199, SEIU, are all saying, you know what? We can live with this. We can live with this. And we want you, as a member of the legislature, to support this program. Um, and so what the governor has said is he wants to reduce our budget from 136 last year down to 132.5. And what he's also said was, we are going to let the high earner uh, surcharge um, sunset this year. Uh, immediately, people went ballistic about that as well. And uh, what occurred is on the day the governor um, proposed his budget, a friend of mine and a colleague in the assembly 
had an op-ed in the New York Daily News saying, we must keep the high earner surcharge, and maybe we should even increase it. Well, this was ridiculous. And the governor has said, it's just off the table. Um, and the governor has certain powers in our state. He has a line item veto. He also has the power of, we have two different types of bills. We have our appropriations bills, which ha has the numbers in it. And then we have the Article 7 bills, which are uh, statutory language about how programs are going to work. And there was a court case a few years ago that basically said if the governor puts statutory language in the appropriation bill, the legislature cannot change that language. All we can do is accept or reject the program. And this gives the governor uh, you know, a lot of strength in bargaining. He also has uh, the ability to um, let the, uh, the government shut down. In New York, um, we have a long and proud history of having late budgets. Um, uh, I think 18 of the last 22 years, we've had a late budget. Um, and this puts strain on legislators. It's in the law that once the day, the minute the budget is late, our paychecks as legislatures, legislators gets held. So suddenly we don't, we don't get paid. And so many times, and this happened last year, we went all the way into mid-August. And uh, you know, that gives the governor power. And we also had the issue where Governor Patterson did something which was unique last year. In previous years when there have been past late budgets, we, uh, the, governor, um, the governor would just end up an extender bill saying we're going to fund all current programs at their same level from the previous year. Well, Governor Patterson started putting parts of his budget that we didn't like into these extender bills saying basically you can either choose to accept this or shut down the government. So what Governor Cuomo has done is he's built on this and said, you know, we can either negotiate a budget within the framework that I've given you, or I will just send you one extender bill that has my budget with none of the changes that you guys want in it whatsoever in, um, in, in, uh, in one bill, and you're just going to have to accept it or explain to the voters of the state of New York why you shut down the government. And I personally don't want to do that, because if you look at the polls in the state of New York from a, a purely political perspective, the governor has a 70% approval rating, and the New York State Assembly has an 18% approval rating. <laughs> Who's getting blamed? I'm getting blamed. I don't want to be blamed for shutting down the state of New York. I also don't want to be blamed for letting New York spiral down the, the road that it's on, which is just spending to our heart's delight. You know, I was joking before with Jim, you know, our motto in our state should be, uh, if you want to do it, we want to tax it. Some of the taxes that we installed in our assembly budget this year were, was a tax on breast cancer screenings. Yes, a surcharge every time you went to the doctor to get to the radiologist to get, to get a screening. And the reason we did this is we have no concept of the real world. We have no concept that just because we have this tax on hospitals who have multiple sources of income that we cannot put this tax on, a, you know, on an outpatient procedure where it's just a doctor in a doctor's office, it's your local radiologist. We are basically going to shut down people's availability to cancer screenings. I got up and I said, you know, I see that there's a surcharge on obstetrics. Why do we want to have a baby? Why do we want to have a baby having tax? Because that's what it was. It was a 4% surcharge. I said, well, it's not really a tax on having a baby. I said, so you're telling me it's not a 4% surcharge on obstet obstetricians and the procedures they do. I said, what's the majority procedure that obstetricians do? It's delivering a baby. So I understand we, we have some population problems in New York. We, we're, we're losing population. <laughs> But I, I, I don't think we want to be driving out population like this. Um, the one issue that our governor is going to face, even if he wins all of these battles, um, uh, is this. And we, we've seen this time and time again. We in the legis legislature, we, we have time on our side. A go governors come and go. I have members of the legislature who have been there literally 40 years. The, the chair of our health committee got elected in 1970 when he was 21 years old and he's still in the legislature today. So we, we have time on our side. And if we don't get something, as, as Matt talked about, where we have you know, the nexus between income growth and population in statute, we are just going to slowly, over time, once Governor Cuomo leaves, undo some of the gains he's made in reducing spending, controlling spending, bringing things back uh, down to a realistic perspective. And history proves it uh, with Governor Pataki. 
you know, Governor Pataki came in with a bang in 1994. He really changed the budget in New York State, reduced it quite significantly, reduced taxes quite significantly. I didn't agree with him, but that's, that was the case in 1995. And then as we got into his second term, the legislature just slowly undid all the gains that Governor Pataki had made in slowing the, the growth of our budget, and it exploded in his last term, in his third term. And so what we need to do is put something in statute. So when I read uh, Matt the Mercatus uh, Center's report, I forwarded it on to the governor. I said, you know, we need to be looking at doing something like this, that we can't just have it uh, for one budget year or two budget years. And it's interesting, Matt brought up biannual budgets. What the governor put in our budget for both Medicaid spending and for education spending was a biennial budget. And part of it was political because next year we have an $800 million growth in education spending. And I think part of that was not so much the formula, but realizing he could probably calm some of us in the legislature if, uh, if you know, we, uh, we knew that next year, uh, you know, spending uh, on education would explode again. Um, and, and so that's really sort of the end of my talk is that you need these things in statute and you need the things to have a supermajority to actually ensure because otherwise you have a budget process that ends up like the state of New York. Uh, I forgot to mention we have a nickname in the state of New York for the, what, what our budget process is called. It's called the Big Ugly. And I think I've pretty much explained to you why it's called the Big Ugly. Um, but this is how reporters, many, I mean, this is how the public refers to it. And it's really not how a 130 plus billion dollar budget, the third largest budget between, behind California and the federal government should be done. Um, and we really need to rein in spending. And that's coming from a liberal Democrat. So with that, I thank you guys. Now going, we're now going to hear from Nick Kasprak from our good friends at the Tax Foundation. The Tax Foundation is one of the partners that Mercatus works with in an effort to find solutions for state-based problems. Uh, their expertise added to ours has really been yielding some results and we're very excited to hear what Nick has to say. Thank you. Um, my name is Nick Kasprak and I'm a programmer and analyst at the Tax Foundation. And what I do is I do uh, work with Tax Foundation economists on certain data projects and I also develop interactive online tools. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is our most recently released tool, um, which is our state spending limits calculator. Um, and I'm going to demo that here. And basically what it is, is it's uh, a really nice sort of interactive visual way to look at state budgets and state spending and, and how it's grown over time. Um, and also looking at as well how certain tax and expenditure limits can, uh, can limit state spending. So let me show you how this tool works. Um, the address of the, the site is interactive.taxfoundation.org slash Tabor. Um, and I'm just going to show you how it works. So you can choose any of the 50 states. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick New York for now just because Assembly Member Kellner is here. And so I think it's worth looking at New York. Um, and we can, we can look at state spending uh, and how expenditure limits uh, can affect it. So, uh-oh, uh, that's not good. Um, uh -oh. All right. Um, technical difficulties here. Yeah, uh, it seems like the internet access has expired on the uh, on the computer. So if somebody could help me out with that, that'd be great. Thanks. This isn't a tax foundation problem; it's a George Mason problem. While we have a, a lull here for a minute, I would like to say hello to those who are joining us on live streaming, and particularly, I'd like to recognize our. Uh, SPN affiliate groups that I know who are with us today, the Commonwealth Foundation in Pennsylvania, thank you for joining us, and the Bluegrass Institute in Kentucky, thank you for joining us and being part of the event today. 
we are delighted to have SPN groups from around the country tuning in be good. on right. the live stream. Uh, still giving me the this page here. Um, is that no? Anyone have any ideas? There we go. Quick thinking right there. Excellent. It's Thank like you, the Dan. adaptable uh, solution right there. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, so let's let's go back here and and show you. First, I'm going to show you is just uh, New York State spending from 1997 um, until now, and I'm picking 2007 for the base year, just so that you'll see why in a second. Um, all right. There we go. So. This orange line here is just a graph of nominal state spending in New York State from 1997, or 1977 sorry, to 2008. Um, and this is spending by the state government only. Um, so you can see in 1977, spending is around $11 billion. Uh, and now it's well over $100 billion. Um, so a lot of that is inflation. So let's adjust that for inflation. We can do that. So now if I check this box, we're going to look at these values in real $2,009 instead of nominal amounts, all right? So now you can still see the growth. It's not quite as drastic as it was. Um, okay, okay. Um, back to this again. Uh, let's, let's go back. Hmm. Uh, oh, okay, I see. Just flashed at me. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, so that, that is uh, state spending in, in real amounts right there. Uh, so if we look at this, you can see there's, there's a noticeable increase around the year 2000. All right? That's where it really starts to, to shoot up. Um, so we can ask ourselves, OK, uh, well, what would happen if we went to the year 2000 and we imposed a, a tax and expenditure limit uh, in that year? Uh, so the default here is a population and inflation limit, which is the basic uh, taxpayer's bill of rights, or TABOR as it's sometimes known. And I'm going to set the base here at 2000. And this will draw this blue line right here. And this blue line right here represents the spending limit given the parameters that I've chosen. Um, so. The values here are already inflation adjusted because I've checked this box. I can uncheck it and it will readjust the graph like that. Um, and so it's pretty much, it's a slight flat line. It's got a little bit of a positive slope because that's, that's from the population growth, which is uh, much less in magnitude than the inflation. Um, so you can get a good kind of visual sense of, of the sort of magnitude that you're looking at with a typical expenditure limit. Um, the other box we can check down here is this per capita values box. Um, there we go. So that will adjust um, the values over here. Uh, so they're working them, looking at the uh, state spending on a per capita basis rather than just the, the total spending amount. Um, and so if you're doing a, a population and inflation limit here, you're always going to get a flat line because you're already adjusting the graph for those two factors. Um, uh, so this gives you a really good kind of visual sense in 1980. Uh, State spending in New York uh, was around $2,100 per capita in real $2,009, and that amount has been steadily increasing. So I can move the base year around, and you're just going to get a flat line wherever you choose um, because of the way the graph is adjusted. So let's go back to, to the year 2000 um, and go back to the uh, real, uh, sorry, inf uh, the nominal values and the, uh, the total amounts. And right here, we get a nice kind of sort of, it kind of adds it all up. So in the time period that we've chosen, the total spending is $722.4 billion. But under the limit, uh, the maximum amount of spending would be $600 billion. So we have a, 
a total reduction in spending of at least $122.2 billion. Now, one of the problems that people often bring up in relation to, to Tabor limits is this idea of a ratchet down effect, um, which is the idea that uh, if you're spending so much in one year um, and the limit in the next year is based on the spending the previous year, then you're always going to be needing to spend up right up to that limit in order to maintain that limit into the next year. Um, the way that this is formulated on this calculator avoids that effect entirely because we're always looking at the limit relative to a certain base year. We're not chaining that limit from year to year. Um, and as Matt pointed out earlier, there are lots of different ways that tabers can operate. Um, uh, some of them will operate from year to year and, and have the limit be based on the previous year, whereas uh, others will be based on sort of a, a given base year. And I think uh, Colorado is, a, is an example of a taper where originally um, the limit was based on spending in the previous year. Um, and so you had this kind of ratchet down effect where the state had to spend up to that limit in order to get the highest possible limit for the next year. Um, but I think they just changed that recently so that it's, uh, rel it's always based relative to a certain base year. Um, and so the limit is, is constant and, and not based on the previous year. Um, so, so far I've just shown you the, the population and inflation limit, but there are many other options too. I can do just inflation, uh, I can do population plus inflation, plus I can add a certain arbitrary percentage if you just want to see what that looks like. So let's just add 3% per year, and obviously that will make the limit a lot more generous. So that's a pretty generous amount, so let's set that back to zero. Um, and you might ask at this point, well, Maybe there's a reason why state spending went up so rapidly around 2000. Maybe that's just a function of the fact that the state's income and, and economy grew rapidly around that time. But uh, we can also pick nominal state GDP as, as the basis for one of our limits. And even then, you can see that state spending still grows a lot faster than just uh, the growth of the, the New York state economy. Um, so What this tool really shows you is that it's a, a great way to look at any state you want and just get a sense of, of what the spending looks like, how the spending has risen over time, and it, it really gives you some great context because you can look at these limits, um, which I think make intuitive sense to people, things like state GDP and population plus inflation, uh, and you can really get a sense of just how rapidly state spending has grown uh, in the past three decades and particularly in the, the past 10 years or so. It's much faster than any of these limits, which I think make sense to people. Uh, if we look at, for example, California, it um, looks uh, very much the same as New York. Um, numbers are bigger because California is bigger, but uh, you get the same kind of pattern. You know, state spending really starts to rise rapidly right around here and so forth. Uh, we can also look at Virginia, since we're in Virginia. Um, there we go. Um, so here's an example of a state where, where spending has not risen quite as, as precipitously, precipitously um, as New York and California. Um, this is, again, the population plus inflation limit, and we can look at nominal state GDP. And so here's a state where, where the growth of the state government is, has broadly kept pace with um, the growth of the state economy, except even at the very end here, you can see that the limit is, is or the spending has gone up quite quickly. Um, so that's basically what the tool is, how it works, uh, and you can get to it by going to interactive.taxfoundation.org slash Tabor. And uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to Matt, uh, and we can start off the questions. Nick, can they also access that through the Tax Foundation main page? Yep, so let me just show you where that is. If you go to our main website, hopefully this works. Um, our main website is just www.taxfoundation.org. And uh, I'll wait for the page to load uh, for a moment here. And the tool looks great. It's just uh, a shame that GMU's technology kind of let us down there. Oh, no problem. <laughs> it worked we out in the end. We hope they fare better in the NCAA than, uh, than they did with the technology Absolutely. today. All right, well, uh, the page seems to be taking a while to load, but uh, you'll see a link to it right on our right sidebar uh, once you get to the page. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for now, and hopefully eventually it will come up. Thanks, Nick. Sure. We will now begin uh, a 
period of question and answer, and I would like to direct the first question, since I, I get the prerogative of asking the first as the moderator, to uh, Dr. Matt Mitchell. There's been a fair amount of talk about something called TABOR, the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, and how that was used in Colorado. But it seems that Colorado spending has actually uh, gone up fairly dramatically in the last few years. Was TABOR a failure? How did that work? Uh, yeah, so TABOR is probably... Uh, so TABOR is probably one of one of the more um, restrictive of tax and expenditure limits. Um, it was put on in the mid '90s, um, and it actually worked extraordinarily well in terms of limiting spending. There were a couple things that uh, uh, ultimately sort of undid it. Um, one is is this ratchet effect. So as, as Nick pointed out, um, TABOR did have this this property where it was based on last year's budget. So that was your base year. So whatever happened last year, if you were in a recession and your budget actually fell through no choice of the legislators, no choice of the policymakers, it, your new, your new uh, Tabor limit was based on last year. So that meant every time it hit a recession, it really ratcheted it down. So this was a pretty restrictive limit, and, and some people complained about that. But the other thing that, w that uh, is interesting is that while Tabor said that, that the budget could not grow faster than inflation plus population growth, there was an, another amendment added to the state constitution in Colorado which said per pu pupil education spending has to grow at, at the rate of inflation plus uh, you know, one or two percent. So you had two parts of the constitution which were basically on a fiscal collision course one with the other. One part says the whole budget can't grow faster than inflation plus population. The other one says that the budget on education has to grow faster than uh, inflation uh, plus number of students. So when the, the two, the only thing that could happen was that A, either education took over 100% of the budget, or one of these two parts of the Constitution had to, be, had to blink. And what blinked was Tabor. And uh, Governor Owens sus agreed to suspend Tabor, uh, and it was suspended by, um, the, he, he supported a ballot initiative, and it was put on the, on the, um, the books, and the, and the citizens voted to suspend Tabor for five years. It just came back online, and when it did come back online, it, it was without that, um, um, ratchet down factor. It was based on, the, on a previous uh, year's budget, so it shouldn't have that problem. Uh, I actually do not know what the fate of the per pupil spending provision. I think it might still be in, in, the, in the Constitution, so it, that might just set up another problem, but uh, maybe somebody else knows that better than I. Questions from the audience? Hi, Morgan Pulitzen here. Um, questions mainly for uh, Mr. Kellner. I know that Tabor has been very controversial in Colorado, uh, and I believe it was just a similar proposition was just uh, defeated in Maine. What do you think are the political chances of something like this being implemented in New York or other states? Uh, zero to none. Um, is, is my mic on? Um, yeah. Um, uh, New York uh, has a very interesting when it comes to constitutional amendments. Uh, basically, it's got to pass the legislature, not two consecutive years, but in two consecutive legislatures. So it has to pass twice over four years. And then there needs to be a constitutional convention. Um, and then it needs to go before the voters. And this basically means every time someone brings up any time we need to change the constitution, someone brings up this process. And so it just goes into the scrap heap. So I really don't. Also, we just have um, too many vested special interests. Uh, I spoke before about the hospitals, but you also have um, on the education side, um, there is just so much spending that goes on to keep the status quo. I, I don't see it happening, sadly. Sort of related to that, but but let's take beyond New York. I mean, right now we, we have some states feeling like they're in a crisis mode with legislators thinking that their hair is on fire. How do we cut through the clutter, though, so they're not addressing what you call the in-period change and they're looking for more systematic reforms down, down the road? The best way to message or just get this you know, in, their, in their sights? So this is for me again. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the thing is, and this is what occurred in New York, uh, you have to take... Um, their natural allies away. I mean, what the governor did, I mean, for, for the, the 
the hospitals and the hospital unions to be sitting here saying, hey, we want this. Like, like you know what, we understand there have to be cuts and we would much rather prefer uh, to have been a part of that. And we got, you know, we got some of the things we wanted, we gave up some of the things. Um, you need that because otherwise, um, you know, sadly, I, I often joke, we get in our conference room to discuss issues as the Democratic Conference in the Assembly, and uh, they must filter something through the air because people forget the outside world. They, they only sort of hear what's going on in the Capitol. And, and again, that goes back to many of my colleagues not having competitive races, not having to go out on the street every two years and shake hands and talk to voters. Um, but you really need um, to sort of break people out of that bubble to, to have them hear what people are actually saying out there. And if there are consequences for their actions, um, they will break through that clutter. If there are no consequences, you know, the same is just going to continue to be true. Hi. Hi. Uh, Ryan Lynch, uh, question for Dr. Mitchell and also uh, Mr. Casper. Uh, it, it's a question about the modeling. Uh, when I look at Sorry about that. Uh, could you hear me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so a question about the modeling. I mean, uh, it looks like it, it, the question applies for both the, the slide, uh, Dr. Mitchell, that you showed in terms of, I think it was Arizona at the yeah. beginning of your presentation, as well as for, for this here. Mm -hmm. How do you choose uh, sort of the year to start with, um, and how do states go about deciding, you know, where this graph ought to start? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I, th I think historically, so the question is, how do the states choose what year to make their base year? Um, historically, I think it's a little—it's been a little bit accidental. Um, these things, the first tells, uh, started in the, in the mid '70s and early '80s, and so they basically just used those years. Um, but the, uh, I think increasingly, what you're seeing is states are, seeing, are are going back to a retroactive year. And so, like Colorado, what it did when it redid Tabor, as I understand it, is. They picked some uh, a group of years in the 90s and uh, or maybe it was the 2000s, um, early 2000s, and said we're going to average it based on those years. And that was a little bit of a political compromise. They basically said, look, we're going to limit ourselves to these to these years, controlling for inflation over popul uh, and, and population. But look, these are years in which spending was relatively high. So that was a compromise for people who uh, you know didn't want to have uh, Tabor come back. They said, well, we'll, u we'll use years where it's a relatively high, high amount. Um, so I think it, it probably varies from state to state. It's probably accidental in most states. But you can do it where you sort of sit down and say, um, does it make sense to live off our 2008 budget based if we control for inflation plus population? If not, what is, should it be our 2005? You know, pick, just pick a, pick a year that seemed like a reasonable year where per capita spending after controlling for inflation, we could live on, on, that, same, on that same budget. I yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, it's usually. Yeah, so the question was, was you know, you're, you're still better off having it based on today than based on a few years prior, and I, I agree. I mean, it's going to be uh, probably more difficult to, since spending basically the rule for spending for most states, except for maybe Virginia, is. Uh, on a per capita real basis, it grows year in, year out. Um, if you use any previous year, you're going to end up um, having to have real cuts. And so it's hard, hard, harder to sell that. In terms of sellability, though, wouldn't the Baylor uh, Sunstein argument work best? Uh, why don't we put it two years forward from now? That's when we'll put it in? Because it, then it's just kind of behavioral reasons? Yeah, maybe. Um, the, the question there, so the question is, uh, he, he's referring to, to Baylor and Sunstein who wrote um, Nudge. Um, and the idea is maybe from a behavioral economics perspective, if we, if we uh, based it in a couple years, might that be easier to sell? I, I think potentially it also has the problem of sort of saying, I'm going to start dieting two years from now. And so what are the, isn't it easy to go, to go around? We have another question back there. I, mean, I think spending restraint can, can work in a variety of ways. Many mm -hmm. would argue with um, California having with uh, California having, um, I mean, supermajority requirement for increased taxes, that mm -hmm. that was put in, a, in with a goal of having spending restraint. And you've just seen, you know, um, uh, many different special interests just work their way around that, looking at other avenues to drive spending. And now, you know, it, 
I don't think it's held out as an example of much as it relates to good government, at least. Um, where I, so the broader question is just kind of where, where have you seen successful implementations of um, the controlling mechanisms, mm -hmm. and are, are there specific, primarily political um, uh, landscape that, that lends itself to that and, and allows for that to to, to advance? Yes. Yeah, so where have we seen uh, successful spending restraint? When I look at it, it seems to me like you can. You can't find one place where everything was working, but you can find bits and pieces from time periods. So Cal uh, California is actually an example where for a number of years they had a, a what was called the GAN Amendment, which is basically inflation plus population tax and expenditure limit, uh, and it did seem to work for a while. Um, most states general, uh, generally, if they have a, a supermajority requirement for tax increases, that tends to work. They spend about 2 or 3% less per capita. One important caveat there is that it's very popular for states to pick one type of tax that the citizens don't like. So, so California, again, is a, is a perfect example there with Prop 13 in, in the 70s. Everybody hates property taxes. And New Jersey is targeting property taxes right now. Chris Christie wants to impose a limit. But if, if you impose a limit on one tax, just property taxes, well, the legislature finds it pretty easy to pick, a, pick another tax that isn't limited and raise that one. So that's another reason for having an overall limit that's based on spending, not taxing. Uh, other, things, other things work uh, uh, in uh, Oregon. They have what's called the kicker law, which is basically an, an aspect of its tax and expenditure limit that automatically kicks back um, refunds if, you, if you, the state brings in more than what the legislature um, it, is restrained by from, from its tax and expenditure limit. Same thing with Colorado. Um, so you, I, I wish there were one story where you could say this state really has done it well, um, but it's, it's really sort of a mix of state, uh, uh, of institutions. What we do know is that there are a lot of things that in study after study after study make a, make a difference. And sometimes they're a little difference, but when you add them up, and again, these are things like good tax and expenditure limits, supermajority requirements for tax increases, uh, item reduction vetoes, a special variety of veto that I talked about, and uh, strict balance budget requirements. What, what good are spending limits if they hide trillions of dollars in spending off the books? Yeah. And, and for uh, Representative Kellner, if you haven't checked a, a Truth in Accounting Laws a site called truthinaccounting.org, you ought to check it out and try one in New York. Well, one of the issues we have in New York is we have, um, uh, there's actually no, no one actually has the exact number. We have over 700 public authorities and public benefit corporations, um, many of whom are able to uh, put out their own taxes, also who can run up uh, a tremendous amount of debt. The vast majority of New York State's debt is not run up by the official government, but run up by the sh shadow governments. I actually have one in my district. We have uh, Roosevelt Island, and basically there is a public benefit corporation that runs Roosevelt Island. It's basically so you have this basically small town in the middle of New York City where you have an unelected uh, representative body from, uh, they're, they're all appointed by the governor or the mayor, um, and they decide uh, what are basically taxes uh, for these folks uh, built into their ground leases because the, none of the, building, the buildings, the land that they're owned on is owned still by the, uh, the city and the state. So you have taxes for a private police force, private sanitation, um, a private parks department, all while they're still paying all of their taxes to the city of New York on top of that for all of these services that they should be getting, so they end up paying double. Yeah, yeah. One, one thing I tried to do was I thought I would be ambitious and go through, so all my data relies on uh, 30 years from 48 states, so it's a lot of data. I, at first I thought I was going to be ambitious and try to collect data on what are the loopholes. Are there other are states that don't? You know that apply this limit to the whole thing, uh, and you know after I had pulled out some hairs, I just decided this is not something I'm gonna. It's gonna be feasible because it's too complicated to figure out what these loopholes even are. Uh, you look at a state like Utah, which on the books has a very very good tax and expenditure limit, and then you start looking at it, and what what it applies to is uh, it exempts state education, which is a third of the budget. Um, so there's, there's some of these loopholes you can you can try, but drive a truck through them, unfortunately. On the, on the tax foundation uh, 
model. Most states, at least Virginia, divides its budget between the general fund and non-general fund. General fund are those things that are funded by taxes, income tax, sales tax, so the legislature has control over. Non-general fund is federal grants, tuition, those kinds of things that the, that the General Assembly really has no, no impact on as far as how much comes in. You divided that out because that makes a big difference in taking a look at what you can really control and what you can't. Unfortunately, it does not do that. This, the, the data is based on um, the U.S. Census survey of state governments and state and local governments. Um, uh, and we just use direct, direct non-intergovernmental spending, I believe. Um, so we don't break it down any further than that. And that, that is certainly a, a weakness of the tool. But it, at the same time, it does show you, at least it gives you a good general sense of, of state government spending growth. Um, is, the, is, the, is the model available to tweak so that we could do that? Um, because the inflation and population figure would say the same. It's the dollar amount. If we went back 10 years, gave you the figures, and we had access to that model, and we could put in those dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure I understand that, that, that last bit. Um, but what I will say is um, I mean, it would be very easy in, a, in, in, the, in, the non, in, in the general fund budget in Virginia, for instance, to go get the figures. Right. Um, Population and inflation figure stays the same, so that variable mm -hmm. remains. It's not currently available, and that maybe it's something that we decide to add to the tool in the future because, as you say, the data is available, and the, the U.S. Census uh, Survey of State Governments, I'm, I'm sure, does break it down like that. Um, but at the moment, there's no way to do that, um, given what's on the website. So I'd have to go in there and, and rework it a little bit. But that's certainly a project that we can do in the future if, if we think it's worthwhile. Well, one um, thing to add, yeah. Nick, did, mm -hmm. don't you have a feature where you could download all this yeah. data? So, yeah, so, for example, if I go back to... Uh, let's let's do uh, Virginia again. Um, I mean, so you get a big table of all the numbers down here, and and you know you can see the state GDP growth in, in millions if that's what you're using, or if you're using uh, population, sorry, population plus inflation, then the state population and the CPI for that year will appear down there. Will appear down there as well. So all of that is is available, and you can see what the assumptions are. And then there's this button down here which will download this table that you've generated as a, a spreadsheet, which you can open then in Excel. Um, so you know, th this data just isn't there you know, as a cool visual tool. You can actually download it and use it um, for your own analysis. Uh, and certainly, if we wanted to break down, because you know, cause right now we just have state expenditure. It's all one big pile. But we may think about finding ways to break down that pile in the future. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, hi. This is a question for the assemblyman. I uh, thank you for coming down from New York today. Um, I guess my question would be uh, specifically on New York. If you could, you know, taking into the um, uh, Mr. Mitchell's uh, data regarding the nine trillion dollar spending gap that exists in the states, I would assume that much of that, much of those spending gaps, exist in northern states. Uh, in the case of many northern states, specifically in the Northeast. Many of them lost congressional seats this year, which means they're losing population. Um, can, you, can you discuss maybe, Assemblyman, what is the split or, or what are the percentages in your state in regards to how the state raises, you know, is it corporate, what percentage is corporate tax, what percent is personal tax? And if personal tax exceeds corporate tax, how do you, how do you tackle the problem that your state faces from a budget perspective if it's losing population the way that it is? Um, well, uh, you know, our population is actually growing in New York. It's just not growing as fast as other states. I mean, we have, we have the real issue when we were discussing this earlier. Um, you have this issue where there's a very much an upstate, downstate divide where you have, you know, massive urban centers where there is just nothing anymore. Buffalo, Syracuse, they are losing jobs. Um, just uh, 
hugely and people are leaving at the same time people are flocking to New York City. Just so you have a sense of it, uh, the Democratic uh, Conference and the Assembly, there are 99 members out of 150 total in the Assembly. Um, and 65 of those people, 65 of us, come from New York City. 65 out of the 66 Assembly districts in New York City are Democrats. Um, the Republicans finally took back their one seat on uh, Staten Island, or their two seats on Staten Island uh, <laughs> this past time. Term. Um, and so, you know, we, we have the problem where like, we, we can't get out of our own way with taxing in New York State. Like, we're almost in a competition to see if we can get the growth in personal income tax t to meet corporate taxes. And we are driving Fortune 500 companies um, out of the state. We are, we are not creating jobs. We are not creating a climate for jobs. And it's beyond just the corporate tax versus the personal income tax. It's we, we put so much regulation and so many, uh, as I like to call them, nuisance taxes on companies. You know, you're basically, if you grow up outside of Syracuse, there's nothing for you. I mean, th th there is nothing for you there. You know, you have to leave the state. You have to come down to New York City. Um, and at the same time, you know, you have many of, Many of my colleagues represent poor urban districts where government is big business in their district. Government is the biggest employer. They are the biggest provider of services. So they have no understanding that if you start collecting that one cent stock transfer tax that, you know, you know the New York Stock Exchange doesn't have to move all of its people uh, for across the river. They have to move a couple computers. They, 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 they just don't. They will not believe that. Um, and so there has been a big push over the last couple of years to actually uh, you know, get rid of um, some of these layers of bureaucracy that are, you know, are job-killing. Um, one of my favorites is we are one of the few states that restricts the sale of wine in grocery stores. Wine and groceries. You can only buy wine in one of 2,200 uh, outlets that are, um, that, are, that are given a license by the state liquor authority. Well, we, are the, we were the third largest wine producing state in the nation, but we are falling because people, they don't have a place to sell their wine. Now, you could, without raising taxes, generate a tremendous amount of revenue by just opening up and saying, anybody who has a beer license who sells beer in a grocery store, let them sell wine. You're talking about creating 7,000 jobs, a recent report showed, over the next five years. You're talking about generating $500 million in tax revenue, just mostly on just having these uh, grocery stores who want to pay this franchise fee to sell wine and sales tax. So you're not raising taxes anyway, and you're helping an industry that desperately needs to grow, and it's multiple industry. There's a ripple effect there. Not only are you hiring more people to sell in stores, but the guys who make the casks, the guys who make the bottles, the guys who make the corks, all of their businesses get to grow as well because we're going to produce more wine. And, and that's what we need to be looking for is, is we have just stacked one regulation after another on top of New York State. And, and you know, it's not even the straw that broke the camel's back. The camel's back has been broken several times now. You know, how do we rehabilitate it and get it back up and walking around? I believe the corporate tax way outweighs uh, the personal tax. Um, one of the things, and I'm not sure if this is still true, but before the, 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 the fiscal crisis, 20% of all tax revenue in New York State was generated south of 14th Street. And that is because that is where the financial industry is. And one of our problems in New York State is we basically lived off of bonuses. Everyone who was attacking bonuses for Wall Street executives. I said, no, 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 no. You know, that's how New York makes up their budget deficit every year is that fourth quarter tax comes in and everyone got a huge bonus and oh, thank goodness, we, we just made it. We, we don't have a deficit any longer. Uh, and you know, one of the things we've tried to achieve is diversifying the economy. You know, we put in a terrific uh, uh, film production and film production tax credit that shows, I believe, for um, every dollar spent uh, it, it, it uh, generates five dollars in economic activity, um, and you know New York is a unique place. You know you don't want people faking a location, you know, up in Vancouver or Montreal when they could easily bring that production to New York. 
And so every year I sit there and say, hey, we shouldn't reduce this. We should be expanding this to make sure we get more productions coming to New York State. And I think we'll have to uh, leave the questions at that point. Um, we are rapidly running out of time here today. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> Assemblyman, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, thanks you for being with us and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Nick, thank you for your presentation. Tax Foundation is a great partner. We always enjoy working with you guys. Matt, it's always a pleasure. And thank you so much for joining us today.